Hi everyone, my name is Greg Setliff. I'm a professor at Kutztown University. And in early 2014, my team was brought in to, to examine what Lycorma della Catula or the spotted lanternfly was doing to native plants and Pennsylvania trees in particular in southeastern Pennsylvania in Berks County. So just a quick review here, Lycorma della Catula or the spotted lanternfly is known to invade other countries uh, from its native range in, in uh, Asia. It has gotten into Korea and Japan. And from studying those invasions, we know a couple of things, mostly from anecdotal observations and some scientific observations, that the preferred host of the pest is Ailanthus altissima, or the tree of heaven. But it also attacks many other trees and plants uh, in, in South Korea, in particular, we know it goes after grape, which is a commodity of great concern in our area. We know from looking at the literature that although many of the plant species are not directly shared with Pennsylvania, many of related trees and, and, and other plants are. So in, in case we have about 60 species where there's an overlap in the genera between Korea and North America in the plant list that the Koreans are seeing on being attacked by Lacoma della Catula and by what we have and expect to be possibly attacked here in North America. So I'll go into briefly some of the experiments we've done uh, in the 2015 and 2016 uh, summers to, to examine this. <clears throat> so we set out to try to find out what spotted lanternfly was doing here on PA plants and determine a couple of things about that. For example, if, if spotted lanternflies host preference changed as they got older, which is something that we, suggest, we, we, we suspected from the, from the literature. We also wanted to identify possible alternative hosts that would support populations of, of spotted lanternfly. Um, while the main host of the Atlantis altissima was being managed. So our protocols were very similar to that of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture study on Atlantis altissima. So the PDA are, are using brown sticky bands on Atlantis altissima, the primary host of the pest, to catch the migrating nymphs. And the nymphs will climb up the tree from the base on a daily basis to get up to access the crown. And so the sticky bands provide a barrier and actually capture and kill individuals. We did a similar protocol on non ailanthus trees. So these are your oaks and maples and elms and uh, birch and lots and lots of other tree species, 30 more different tree species. We, um, we did record, for example, a couple of things. We, we made sure our trees were greater than 15 centimeters dbh they were larger trees they were within 10 meters from the edge of the of a path or the road uh, that was not just for convenience sake but also because we believed at the time that spider lanternfly would not go deep into the forest that turned out not to be true but it was um it, we were we were taking a guess and that was what we went with we did record the distance to the nearest tree of heaven from our non tree of heaven trees. And this was to measure the influence of close trees, uh, of close primary hosts on our non host trees, what we thought might be non host trees. And then our, for our protocols, we took the bands down after they were out in the field for two weeks, every two weeks from May to September for two years. For our research sites, we worked entirely inside the quarantine area in Berks County. We worked at four different properties originally. Um, all of these sites were positive for spotted lanternfly in the very first uh, season they were discovered in the late in the winter in 2014. Now we weren't a part of the project at that time, and so we were in early May of, of 2015, starting our project, there were no leaves on the trees, there were no spotted lanternflies out, so we had to choose sites where we knew they might be, and so this is where we ended up working. That turned out to be uh, fortuitous because there's a lot of spotted lanternfly at these sites uh, even today. 
we did work at a commercial orchard, and that commercial orchard was using conventional management practices, was using pesticides, and the pesticides did work to keep the lanternfly out. Um, so we did not uh, continue to work there the, the following year in 2016. We managed a total of, uh, we, we, we examined a total of 30 tree species uh, in our, our first two years of the study. And here's a list of their, their scientific names. And you may not recognize these, but there's a lot of things that are familiar to you. Elm and sassafras, uh, dogwoods, um, hickory, all kinds of things. Birch and uh, tulip tree, maples, oaks, so on and so forth. Essentially, a good cross section of Pennsylvania tree species. All told, in the two years, we killed more than 12,000 um, immature spotted lanternflies. You can see this band up here is spotted with spotted lanternflies. They got stuck on the on the the, the sticky band there. Um, unfortunately, as all of the species in our study, just about all the species, tree species, uh, non-ilanthus trees and ilanthus trees had at least some spotted lanternflies on them over the course of the study. And many of those had many hundreds of individuals attacking or, or using the tree in some way. We weren't um, actually able to witness a, a whole lot of feeding. Um, and so that's an encouraging thing. We did see nymphs feeding on shoots and leaves and on, on stems and vines uh, over the course of the study, but we weren't able to document or very easily document a lot of damage to those plants. Um, and that led to some changes in the 2016 study. So from our point of view, we have a total of 24 studies, uh, 24 uh, plant species, here are the common names that, um, that we did find being utilized by spotted lanternfly over the course of the, of the study. We did find that it didn't really matter if Tree of Heaven was close to these trees or not. Um, you know, a, a black walnut that had a Tree of Heaven next to it and a black walnut that was at least 60 meters away or more than 60 meters away from of a Tree of Heaven had approximately the same load of, um, of spotted lanternflies on it. So it did not seem to, um, at least our study indicated, it did not seem to have a strong influence. But one of the things we were able to confirm statistically was that overall, um, spotted lanternflies do prefer ilanthus. And this supports the, the Pennsylvania Department of Ag's decision to, to focus on this plant. It gives, allows for sort of a, a focus management option. And this is good because at least um, overall, while they are on lots and lots of different trees in the forest, they will preferentially align to Ilanthus. Now, one of the interesting findings, uh, at least interesting to me, is that while they're juveniles, what we call the first through third instar stages, what is the time between their, their time they hatch from the eggs, to their third molting stage before they molt for the fourth time. Um, at this stage, they are just as likely to be on other trees as they are Ilanthus, Altissima. And so they're, um, they're, there's no statistical difference shown here because they're just pretty much evenly distributed across a lot of the trees in the forest at this point. <clears throat> When we looked at the development and the phenology of when the different life stages were on our trees, captured on our tree bands, we did not find a difference between that and what the PDA was finding on their bands. Very similar phenology, so not surprising that you know, they're not developing any faster or slower on the other trees. And that's probably because, in reality, they probably moved between them um, across the landscape. But one of the findings that was significant in, our, in this study was that at the end of July, um, right before August began, uh, we began to see very few spotted lanternflies on non-ilanthus trees, while the PDA continued to get 
Spotted Lantern flies for an additional 50 days on Tree of Heaven. And so this is significant. It suggests that in the forest, the, the nymphs at some point in their development, probably around the fourth instar, begin to leave other trees and they congregate on Tree of Heaven. And we, at some point, we eventually just stopped managing the, uh, the non-Alanthus trees because there was nothing happening on them when the adults, certainly when the adults were out. <clears throat> so um, we wanted to find out a little bit more about whether or not these non-Alanthus trees could be used for, um, could be used as a secondary host. We knew it wasn't the primary host, that's Ailanthus altissima, and that's where, at least at some point in their life, it appears spotted lanternflies have to congregate on in order to complete their life cycle. Um, and ideally, we were going to, uh, early on in, this, in, the, in the season, capture nymphs and enclose them in these, what you can see here are some, some sleeve enclosures, trap them on the branches of different tree species, and keep them on there until they develop to adults or they all die. Uh, unfortunately, our funding uh, and, and back ordered sleeves sort of slowed that process down. And by the time, and the fact that this in 2016, um, we had a nice warm winter and, and things seemed to be moving pretty quick. Before we were ready to do the study, we already had adults in the field. So we had to modify a little bit and we captured wild caught adults. Um, who, and, and trapped them into these sleeves, and we ran uh, replicates of black birch, sassafras, spice bush, sugar maple, tulip poplar, wild grapevine, and, and atlantis. And, and then we also did a control where we just took a dead stick and tied it up in the canopy and put a sleeve on that. And what we were doing is we were controlling to see if if these guys, if these spider lanternflies are able to live on black birch, which we know they're using as nymphs, but as the adults, um, are, they, are they able to live on there? Are they able to continue to survive over a period? And can they survive better on black birch and sassafras than they can on just a dead stick? Uh, and so that was where we, where we started that study. We ran this entire study uh, two times, so we had a total of 10 replicates each each one having 10 adults, so 100 adults were subjected to this study for each species. <clears throat> we standardized where the sleeves were in the canopy and how much sun and shade conditions they had, um, so they were all at the same height in the plant, uh, things like that. And every four days, we went back to check to see how many um, SLF, how many spotted lanternflies were still living. We also uh, indicated whether or not honeydew, which is the byproduct from feeding on phloem, the, the, the waste product that the lanternflies produce when they're actively feeding. And we were seeing if there was honeydew produced on the sleeves and if any of the sooty mold that's associated with that was growing on the sleeves as well. Now this is a busy little graph here. Uh, essentially what you have is the burgundy line indicated here is the control. So this was essentially spy lanternflies trapped in a container with no living plant tissue. And you can see by eight days on, all the spotted lanternflies were dead in the study. So percent of the population here, from 100% alive to 0% alive, uh, by eight days they were all dead. Now all of our plant species performed slightly better, but only slightly. So all of our non-Ailanthus plants, ex with the exception of Ailanthus and grapevine, these two lines here, they all did pretty well by day four, but began to decline rapidly. And by day eight, all but a few of them were dead. By day 12, they were all dead. So this is on black gum, uh, sorry, black birch, sassafras, the spice bush, and the, the maple. So all of these plants, we're able to support the, the spotted lanternfly only for a couple more days past having no food at all. And it does not suggest that they're a very good secondary host. Um, however, grape, vine, and tree of heaven, 
uh, the individuals, the majority of individuals, at least half or more of the individuals survived till the end of our study when we called it at day 12. We actually went past this to day 20 just to see what would happen, uh, but we didn't do that for all of them, so I'm not showing the data here. And the grape and the ailanthus all survived way on out to day 20 as well. Honeydew and sooty mold production on the sleeves was significant. Uh, you can see here, this is after uh, the, the 12 days in the field uh, of, uh, of one of our tree species. I don't see which one that is, but um, probably the birch, it looks like. There's very little you know, damage done to the sleeve. Whereas out here on the tree of heaven, there's a lot of sooty mold growing on the inside of the sleeve, and the sleeves are just dripping with the honeydew. Uh, from the Ailanthus, from the um, from the spotted lantern fly. So to wrap up here, um, we have a couple of conclusions to support the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's management plan. Uh, immature spotted lantern flies are broad generalists, and they will likely be able to impact a number of different North American plant species. The extent to which they do that is still unclear. The adult preference for Ailanthus is going to allow us to target management opportunities. This is already happening, and uh, it turns out we support that as a, as a good idea. Wild grape appears to be a suitable secondary host, and the wild grape is, is likely going to act as a refuge, a place where the spider lantern flies can hide out um, when the Ailanthus altissima is dormant or if it's been removed from a certain area. Now, what's still unclear and what we'd like to discover next year is can spotted lantern fly live on grape and complete its entire life cycle? And that's still unclear because a number of our grape extension workers have been trying to rear spotted lantern fly in the laboratory on grape and not having a great deal of success. So it's possible that they may be able to get nutrition from the grape and then have to move to the Ailanthus to trigger some sort of uh, developmental pathway that leads to production of eggs or development into the next larval stage or maybe even the adult stage. It's still unclear what that is, and that that's remains to be seen. Uh, but it is also clear that other trees other non-Ailanthus trees in Pennsylvania can be utilized in some way by spotted lantern fly. And those are going to have to be continually monitored as we remove Ailanthus as a part of the management plan. So as we begin to take away the Ailanthus, uh, we need to keep an eye on and see if, um, if you know, are they now hitting the maples, which could, could be a problem. Um, so we'll continue to watch that. Lots of people to think, and I appreciate you listening to my, my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please get in touch with me. I'm available at the information at the beginning of this talk. Thanks very much.